You want to get to a point where there's no one else in the world that you want managing your money more than you because you know yourself better than anybody else. There's multiple things that go into you know a successful strategy, but Edge has to be one of them. For me, it's your rev growth. If there's EPS there, it's great. You know, fund sponsorship is on the rise. You want people defending the stock that you're looking to get into. All I need to know is are the, the institutions and the big boys and girls matching my assessment? If they are, great. And if they're not, I need to step aside, picking a setup or two and, and perfecting that and seeing it work in real time and doing it consistently. I think that helps. I mean, in order to really have some longevity in this game, you got to have some risk management parameters. You know, in a good market, you want to try and give your stocks the benefit of the doubt. Study thousands of charts because that breeds confidence and confidence will breed more success for you down the road. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I hope you all had a great lunch and got a chance to get a bite to eat and something to drink. Uh, we're back with one of my favorite people to chat markets with, uh, Ryan Pierpont, uh, top performer in the U.S. Investing Championship for a few years running, some, uh, some a couple hundred plus years in there as well, and uh, someone who I've learned a lot about trading from. So, uh, Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time to do this, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation uh, talking about the evolution of a trader. So, yeah, welcome. No, thanks for having me, Richard and, and team. I'm I'm honored to be here and with this group of uh, great people. And yeah, by the way, thanks for putting me right after Lance. It's like, what did I ever do to you? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're it sucks for challenge. me, but uh, yeah, I, I I can listen to Lance talk all day long. The way he transmits his ideas and and um, it's very eloquent and and simple to kind of uh, translate into your own system or plan. So I love listening to him talk. So it's been it's been great. Yeah, for sure. Well, we're looking forward to getting into it. And if anybody has questions at any time, drop them in the chat. Uh, we'll have a Q&A section at the very end, uh, but also I might interject with a few uh, questions just to trip up uh, Ryan's flow a little bit. Uh, but with that said, I'm ready to dive right in. And if you do enjoy this presentation and are finding value in the conference, uh, please go ahead and take the time right now to leave a like down below, uh, subscribe to the channel, and consider a do donation to St. Jude's if you're able to. Uh, and with that, Ryan, uh, the floor is all yours. Looking forward to this. Thanks. So I wanted to um, talk about, you know, the evolution of a trader. And this is more based on my journey I've had. And it's not going to be maybe something that's going to fit everybody's uh, journey as well that they've experienced. But my goal in this is to, it's more aimed at like maybe people that are newer, who are maybe curious about, you know, the world of investing, the world of trading, and sharing my experiences, all the dumb things I did, upfront and the process of you know me going through and learning and i'm trying to basically focus on which things i think need to be you know when i put on the back seat put those in the front seat and that'll kind of help shave some years off um, people's learning curve hopefully so i just want to kind of share my experiences and the pitfalls to avoid and hopefully people can come out of this with somewhat of a um an action plan to uh to get a little better and, and speed up their learning curve a bit so so let's dive in. So who is this for? Again, it's aimed more for the relatively you know newer traders, um, but it's a good reminder as well for people that have been more experienced and have been around a while. Like I've been doing this you know 14, 15 years, and there's still times where you know I'm humbled, and you need a good reminder that you know just when you think you have something figured out, you get you know the two by four to the back of the head and and it's like hey i need to get back on track here and you don't want to get complacent ever and so um you know i think it's more geared for the the novice but um it's a good reminder for for folks that are experienced as well so i think it's good to start you know before we even engage in this endeavor is to kind of ask like you know why do we choose to trade why we you know why do we choose to invest and i think the simple answer is you know, we want financial gain. I think that's probably most people's <laughs> answer number one. Um, you may have a, a passion for this. You've um, been around people growing up. Maybe your parents were involved in the markets or your friends or whatnot. And, you know, it's something that interests you. Or maybe you love a good challenge. Uh, you like the idea of perhaps one day, you know, becoming independent and, you know, having your free time spent um, elsewhere if you have, you know, financial gains in the market, et cetera. So, no matter what your drive is and why we do this, I think this one here, passion, and with anything in life too, if you don't have any passion, then chances are you're not gonna sustain and wanna drive and get better at something. So for me, you don't have to have, you know, 100% passion for something, but if your passion level is at zero, it's hard to really make any meaningful progress in whatever endeavor you're trying to go after. So I think it's important that 
Um, you have some passion level as you go through this because there's going to be setbacks along the way and you have to have that perseverance and drive to want to keep moving forward. So I've kind of broken them down into different phases. And again, this is loosely based on my experiences and how my journey started. So I was in college, um, you know, back in the early 2000s. And, you know, I took some finance classes and things like that. And and I think I joked with you earlier, Richard, about, you know, reading The Random Walk Down Wall Street. One of my professors gave me that book and I was reading it. And I kind of didn't like it because it was basically saying the market's like a crapshoot and <laughs> and uh, so on and so forth. But, you know, there's other classes I took, um, you know, where you have professors teaching different things. There was one going over options and, you know, had the Black Shoals model. And so it's like, oh, that's kind of interesting to me. That was a little more, you know, sexy or intriguing versus just buying, you know, common stock. And so there's things like that that you may encounter along the way um, that gets you, that pique your interest or you have inspiration from, you know, someone who's done it successfully and you want to learn more about that person like wow how'd that person get to the point where they're at um that sounds inspiring i want to go ahead and, and take a dive and, and see if i can maybe do something similar um you know you maybe dive into some books you start you know reading some blogs that people have um, dive into videos you know those are good first steps and then after you know, that initial discovery phase your interest may be peaked even more so you kind of you kind of keep on going and going to that that next step so that next step for phase two for me was more on the experimenting side and you know it's choosing a style some people may kind of put this later in their journey but for me um it was more around your putting your personality matching it with what type of strategy you want to have do you want to be a day trader do you want to be you know a swing trader where you're comfortable holding overnight but maybe not for multiple quarters on end like a position trader or an investor um, or if you're more long game and you want to just try and catch, you know, the next big Google, Amazon, Apple and hold for years and de decades, and maybe you're more of an investor. Um, so I think you go through this period of, you know, you want to get interested in something. Um, I need to kind of fit and choose my style. I went through different types of styles. I day traded for a little bit. I wasn't very good at it. And, you know, I, my patience level isn't the best where I can just sit on something for years on end. So I'm kind of in between um, where I eventually landed more in the swing trading. You hold something for as long as it's working a week, two weeks, three weeks, a couple months. Um, so that's kind of my uh, comfort zone and my sweet spot, if you will. But you can kind of go through these, these different um, trial and error, do it on your own type of um, exercises where you haven't really found a mentor yet, but you're just kind of, dibbling and dabbling around. And obviously the reason you went into this endeavor is, is the end goal. It's like, wow, I can potentially make uh, a life-changing amount of money. And that's why we go into it. So your focus is always on the reward. And you haven't even thought about risk management or any of the other important stuff that goes into it. Um, so you're kind of still in the honeymoon phase, if you will. You, you've, you've just gotten married to this idea that you're going to become the next great trader. And you know, it's all, you know, Disney princess stars and sparkles and smiley, and you haven't really <laughs> ran into the villains and the evil devils on your shoulder just yet. But, um, you know, you go through this period where you're, you're starting to dive in, um, you're learning on your own, you're making plenty of mistakes. And we'll go into some of those mistakes um, later in the presentation. And after a while, you realize you're not very good. So you have to seek out a mentor, uh, whether it's direct or, or indirect, and you want to find somebody that's basically in line with what you are thinking is. So if you're a position trader, you want to find maybe Warren Buffett or, uh, you know, uh, Soros. So these guys that are more investors and they've got a longer term horizon. Um, you know, if you're a swing trader, you can find someone with success. So you, you kind of get into this next step, which I call like the blind follower stage where, you know, you have your time frame identified, you know, you find a mentor that matches your style and you still don't have the confidence because you haven't really put in the work uh, there's a need for handouts since your confident level isn't 100 percent so you still have good intentions you're going through and you want things handed to you on a silver platter so like there was a, a an example i give this option example so when i first started um, as i mentioned you know one of the things that piqued my interest you know in college i had this massive book on options all the different strategies you could do i was like oh this sounds pretty interesting and so i was doing some research online and and I went to the site that was like a signal service and they give you, you know, pics in your email and, and 
you know, I was like wanting something every day. Like I, I'm like demanding, I'm like hitting the, my hand on the table. Like what the heck guys, it's been like two days since you sent something. It's like, I'm paying you, you know, my 99 bucks a month or whatever it is. This is like, I demand <laughs> that we get a, a trade every day and you have no clue. And, and, you know, they're waiting on, um, you know, things to set up. And, and this is kind of how I was in the beginning. It's like, you're, you subscribe to a service or you find other people on Twitter and you are using borrowed conviction because it's their ideas and not yours. And you still have good intentions, but you're still completely lost unbeknownst to you. And you start asking things, you know, to people like, Hey, what do you think of stock X, Y, Z? And, you know, someone says, I think I've said this before. Oh, it looks good. And it's like, okay, great. Good means buy. He says it looks good. So I'm, I'm hammering the buy button and the thing could be, you know, extended beyond belief and whoever said it looked good, you know, that person probably bought it 30, 40, 50% lower. And of course they think it looks good because it's making them money and it's going up. Um, so you go through this whole process of, you know, you want your hand held. And I think my, my main point here is at some point, yes, you will need to find a mentor. Um, especially if you don't know anything, like if I go into some other field outside of training, they have nothing, I know no clue how to do, you know, fixing a car or something like that. I can't just expect to dive in and, you know, be successful at that. I need to find somebody that's really good and can teach me the ropes and I have to put in the time. So you really need to get to the point where you're making decisions on your own because followers are going to struggle in the long run. Um, if you want to be in this for the long game, you will have splashes of success if you're you know, following other people. But at some point you need to grab the reins and, you know, start making decisions for yourself. Because I always talk about, you know, you want to get to a point where there's no one else in the world that you want managing your money more than you, because you know yourself better than anybody else. My personality is different than somebody else's personality. You know, person X, Y, Z, their personality is way different than someone else. So it's important to get to a point where you are confident in executing your plan, your strategy, and something that's, you know, you're most comfortable with. So at this stage, then we go into the the edge stage and the technical side of things. And, and you realize again, you need to take the reins and you start diving into, you know, pattern recognition and, you know, all these, these companies that have come out and gone public over the you know, last hundred plus years, you know, they all have the same type of, of action. There's a new IPO companies need money. They come out, um, you know, they, they start growing and they have a new technology and, and, you know, maybe it goes through a basing phase and, and you get the first breakout, you get a pullback after breakout, you get continuation moves and all these patterns repeat over and over. Then when there's no buyers left, everybody's in the market, uh, you get, you know, no more people to buy. So profit taking comes in, you get, you know, a period of lull and rest, and maybe you get a bear market here and there and the cycle resets. So, you know, going back and, you know, doing pattern recognition, what drives stocks, yes, earnings and, and fundamentals can help add to conviction, but, you know, leveling the playing field and, and diving into charts, kind of reading what market participants are doing, what are, you know, buyers and sellers doing at certain junctions um, throughout history, throughout different periods, and really kind of taking that next step into, okay, what makes stocks move? Because um, without edge, there's multiple things that go into, you know, a successful strategy, but edge has to be one of them. You can have discipline, you can have, you know, plan and process, but you don't have edge, then you have nothing. The other two things don't matter without having edge. Edge is like, you know, operating like a casino. You have to have that edge or else you're going to have randomness and randomness kills performance. So, you know, I like to keep things pretty simple. I know people look at, you know, trading in the market as something that's more complex. Maybe they, you know, think of, you know, you get a random Joe on the street. Oh, what do you think of stocks? Oh, you think of like Goldman Sachs maybe, or all these institutions where there's, you know, people doing millions of different analysis, uh, which may be true. Um, but, you know, for the little guy, and uh, keeping it simple is, is really all you need. Um, like for me, it's easier to follow a plan that is extremely simple because that leads to something that's more repetitive and you can do it more repetitive. You have some, so much complexity, like if you were to take your plan and give it to somebody else and have them try and replicate that if they can't do it it means it's too complex like you don't want like nine million different rules so i think you know for me over the years keeping things extremely simple has really helped me so i i think when you're going through your initial if you're not really familiar with charts or patterns and things like that 
start simple. You don't need to go to, you know, the advanced stages just yet. Um, you know, learn to, to run or walk before you run. So then there's the other side of it, which is, you know, the fundamentals. And, you know, for me, you know, the strong fundamentals are usually the driver of the biggest, you know, stock moves in history. You get some exceptions like you have biotech, uh, maybe a meme stock or, you know, story stocks. They can make great moves. Like people, it always makes me laugh because you get like a GameStop or um, some other meme stock and it starts ripping and, and the setup you're identifying works. And they're chiming, oh, but the, the fundamentals are horrible. And it's just you're like, dude, do you think the stock is moving on fundamentals? It's like, no. I was like, traditionally, yes, the best the best trending stocks will trend for multiple quarters. You can't have a, a multiple year move without strong fundamentals most of the time. Like even these meme stocks that um, run hard, it's usually shorter in duration. It's not going to be for multiple years on end. So, you know, when I'm looking at fundamentals, I try and keep it simple. I'm looking at the top line. Like, is are they growing? Assuming it's not a biotech or a meme or a story stock, are they growing top line? Because EPS may not be there yet and the street may not care. If they can demonstrate that they can consistently drive strong growth and, you know, keep the revenue growing, then EPS may start to come in down the road. The, the street can discount that. They know it may be coming down the pipe. And they will, you know, say, I don't care if they don't have EPS now. I just want to make sure that they're growing because you can't cost cut your way to prosperity. Yeah, you can have a couple of good EPS quarters because you're cutting costs. But at some point, you got to grow the top line. You know, fundamentals, you know, for me, they add to conviction. So if I have a watch list of, you know, 100 names that look good on a chart, like that's how I whittle it down is I want to know, assuming it's not a, a bio or a meme or a story stock, I, I want to know, you know, what stocks exhibit great fundamentals. For me, it's rev growth. If there's EPS there, it's great. You know, fund sponsorship is on the rise. You want people defending the stock that you're looking to get into. Um, but that's it. I mean, for me, time is money. And I know some people like to get into the nooks and crannies of looking through a 10K or a 10Q. And that's awesome. If you have the time to do that, there's there's good value in doing that. Um, but time is money for me. I have wife, I have a couple kids, maybe people are in the same boat, they have multiple kids, time is a constraint throughout the day, they only have so many hours in the day to, you know, focus on what's important. So for me, I have a general sense of, you know, looking at fundamentals. And if there's a company that matches my simple fundamental metrics, I'm like, okay, great. Now, the real question is, is do the big boys and girls that are driving these stocks and managing these stocks at these institutions, do they feel the same way I do? Because they have boots on the ground and you know, whatever term you want to use, I kind of hate using boots on the ground, but um, they're doing their due diligence and you know they've got a million different other things that I'm not even looking at. They can do a way better job of, of breaking apart a company than I can. And if they agree with my assessment and the stock is doing what I expect it to do based on fundamentals, then great. I have that added conviction. But if they can't give a damn about what I think are good earnings and they sell the heck out of the stock, then what I think is worthless. So spending more time diving into the, the extra layers of fundamentals for me, all I need to know is are the, the institutions and the big boys and girls matching my assessment? If they are great. And if they're not, I need to step aside and, and, and reevaluate. So that's kind of the, the, the crux of what I look at and fundamentals. People may dive uh, farther down the rabbit hole. And I, I will say, like, if you start, you know, ramping your account huge and maybe you, let's say you're working for an institution or um, you're managing hundreds of millions of dollars, a billion dollars plus, you can't, you can't just be looking at a chart pattern and <laughs> diving in and buying, you know, millions of shares through a, a five day bull flag or something like that. You have to evolve and elevate your game into the next level and start diving into um, other ways that um, those people like a, a Druckenmiller or Soros, how they view um, the market, you have to look at more of the macro view and it's a whole another ball game. But, you know, for the little guy, I think it's just, again, easier to keep it simple and, and that'll kind of help you uh, in the long run. So then the next phase, after you've kind of gone into like an intro to, to patterns and you think you have a good handle on um, what to look for, you're still not making much progress. You can make, you know, in a good period, some money, but then you give it back. Um, you're buying late, maybe. These are some examples of, you know, pitfalls that I've kind of run into early. Sizing up during drawdowns. It's like you lose money. And, you know, especially now people figure, hey, we're in an instant gratification type age. And like, dang it. I was like, I just lost all that money. I need to get it back right away. And so you're like, 
the, you're looking for the next trade like right away after a loss and you're doubling down when you know your buys are your four five six losers in a row and, and instead of st stepping back and saying okay the market's trying to tell me something it's either telling me that your selection is okay but it's just not the right market environment or it's the right market environment but your your selection criteria is horrible something's off with your your edge and you're not identifying a proper setup so you're going through maybe you're lazy with homework and you don't want to do the work you're still waiting for people to give you hands out handouts so you're making progress giving it back making progress giving it back so this is kind of where you need to, to do a, a, a deep dive people talk about deep dives and you just need to get you know massive massive amounts of homework hours in and you know god bless my wife like we didn't have kids at the time but like there was a time where i had i had no life i was like i was doing okay in the, in the good periods and i'll give it back i was doing okay give it back i said you know what i'm tired of this like i want to get a little deeper into the the crux of how stocks move and so i went into this massive homework session for like three or four months like i didn't go anywhere my wife would be like hey do you want to go out to dinner or something and i'd be like no i was like i'm just gonna sit in my little cave over here and i would just sit there for hours learning you know what drives stocks okay this stock made a big move why is that oh maybe because they just had a surprise earnings beat and you know everybody was short and now they're all caught off guard and so people are covering and maybe now everybody sees that there's an about face like almost like the facebook ipo it was a horrible open um the thing just got crushed and it was going dormant for multiple months couple quarters whatever it was and then out of the blue you get that massive surprise earnings gap and the thing just went on a historic run and you know you want to dive into things like that what are driving stocks um you know sometimes i'll joke like I don't care what the news is. Like, I just want to know what the participants are doing. Are they buying? Are they selling? Are they in an impasse? We're just in a range bound market. But it is good to know, you know, what's driving the stock. Is it on earnings or is it maybe they just had an upgrade or some sort of positive news, but there's churn and the stock's not going any higher or maybe somebody downgraded or there's an offering, but it's just getting gobbled right up and it's still moving higher. So there's like nuances and things like that that you want to pick up as you're going through these, you know, massive deep dives and hours, but I, I wanted to get a PhD in how to read a price chart. And so I just spent multiple months just diving in and I was like, screw this. I don't want any more mediocre performance. And I want to get better at, you know, at least from, from a technical standpoint, um, doing a better job of, you know, where to enter, where to exit, things like that. And again, I think it's important to, um, you know, guys said, learn to walk before you can run. Like people want to learn 9 million different types of setups that work in different environments. But if you can't trade a simple, let's say like a breakout setup or a flag or whatever kind of breakout setup you have, if you can't even trade that one setup consistently for, you know, multiple months, multiple quarters, then how can you possibly, you know, successfully trade seven, eight, nine, and 10 different setups? So I think it's important to maybe get comfortable with one or two. Then once you're consistent with that, then you can start branching out to, you know, other tactics or, you know, other ways of getting into things. But I think that's important. And because again, little wins, you know, breed confidence, and any sort of confidence or small wins keep you engaged and motivated to push on. And I think that's important because it can be very frustrating and it can be very debilitating in the beginning when you're just getting your butt handed to you. And, you know, I'll go to back to the golf example. I used to play golf all the time and, and, I would just be shanking balls left and right on the range and I'd shank, shank, you hit a hundred balls, shank them all. You go back to the drawing board, you go on YouTube, you start looking at, you know, swing videos and you know, how am I going to get better? Okay. This guy's, you know, got his right arm tucked in. He's got a good shoulder turn or maybe I'm, you know, laying the club off a little offset or whatever. You start going through and diving in. You have people videotape you at the range like a lunatic <laughs> and you still just, you just chip away, you chip away and you put in the work and you start hitting those balls. You get the hundred bucket, 100 balls again shank 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 and then it's that one that you just absolutely flush and you look around and you're like whoa did you guys just see that you're kind of the guys in the bay next to you and you just have this like epiphany like all that work i just did and it's starting to pay off there's like little wins that are starting to show up and that's the stuff that kind of keeps you going so back to stocks it's like when you go through that deep dive and you find a pattern on you know stock xyz in the past yeah, from like 10 years ago and you're like okay this is the exact type of environment we're in we're maybe like high in high interest rate or whatever you're trying to match the fundamental side of things to it too like was was the, the time period similar to now 
and you see the exact same pattern show up and then you go to you know you're combing through your charts this time around in present day you see another setup just like that on a different stock and you buy it and it works for you that is like the greatest feeling as a trader who's just starting out because you're like man this this is a, a nice little win and obviously there's more things to it you know entrance is you know finding a good entry point with you know minimal risk is great but you know there's other things to the trade managing the trade where to get out but at least that was a good starting step for me like hey like i'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel i know i have a long way to go but again little wins breed confidence you want to get too dejected you want to have you know, I think if you put too much stuff on your plate at first, it can be a little overwhelming. So just, you know, picking a setup or two and, and perfecting that and seeing it work in real time and doing it consistently, I think that helps. Um, and I, I always joke on these slides, like you still haven't really thought about risk management and discipline here, most likely. So um, so here's like an early. Ryan, can I jump in? Yeah, can I yeah. jump in with the question? So for a deep dive, uh, do you have a recommendation for, you know, the the process that traders can take to actually do that? Like, how do you go ahead and find examples? Do you just like look through the NASDAQ 100 going back the past five years and look for examples like that? What kind of practical things can people use to, you know, go ahead and do a deep dive and study a particular setup? I would say first thing, um, even if you know nothing about, like you've never seen a chart in your life, let's say you're just starting bare bones. I think the, a good exercise is look for just comb through any sort of chart like you have like tc2000 it's easy for me to to comb through all the different sectors or uh, u.s stocks um, international stocks just pull up like a monthly chart or a weekly chart and look at all the big trends whether whether they're down like in a downtrend or whether they're up and then forget the trend but look at the patterns before they made their moves either higher or lower because i think it's the structure of price, the participants, you know, all this euphoria, greed, all these stuff plays out on the price chart. And, you know, sometimes you get caught with your pants down and you see a bullish pattern and and something completely unexpected comes like a CRDO, things at highs and, you know, something comes out and you just you get smashed and, you know, people, oh, the charts lie. It's like, yeah, sometimes <laughs> sometimes, you know, you get surprises and that's part of the game. You got to just embrace it. But um if you know nothing about chart, like that's a great first starting point, like look at the big moves and then what was the structure of the, of the price chart before um, you can go back into like archives. Was there any news that was driving the stock? That way, you know, like, hey, they just beat earnings by um, a huge amount versus what analysts were expecting kind of a thing. And just putting notes together. I had like a big database of like all different patterns. And um, but, you know, I again, I was still learning and I didn't really know. I uh, wasn't an expert at the time, but, you know, I kind of latched on. I saw Dan Zanger's story and you know, he was just a guy building pools in Beverly Hills. And he turned his 11K into like, I think it was high, like 40 something million. And I was like, that's ah, pretty inspiring. And so I want to learn more about this guy. And so I you know joined his site and, and he has an archive where you have like every single newsletter he had, he had like a couple of a week. And so I just basically dove in and went through every single um, newsletter. I was like, okay, what is he looking for? Um, because he would focus on, like I was saying, O'Neill would have, you know, a focus on all the leaders, leadership stocks. Dan was kind of the same way. He was more of an O'Neill disciple. He'd just have the same 10 stocks he'd be focusing on. So every newsletter, you would see the evolution of each of those stocks. It's okay, one day you know, we're building out, we're just range bound. Oh, you know, gap up on earnings, it's going. And you know, I'm reading his comments, what he thinks. Or maybe, you know, it's been, he's been bullish on a stock for, a couple of weeks and uh oh something just happened now he's saying sell like why is that like trying to find those turning points um you know i did that whole deep dive and then from there i kind of went on my own and you know tore apart the charts and again did that exercise of looking for the big moves and then looking at the structure of price um did it shake out a few times before breaking out um were there a couple of breakout fake ups the bulls didn't have any more juice left and so sellers took control and you know failed breakouts things like that so um Again, I think if you have no clue what you're doing, at least at a minimum, even O'Neill's book, go to the first hundred pages of his book. And again, if you don't know anything about a price chart, just look at his commentary, what he thinks is like a good, you know, breakout setup. Um, you know, he's got those weekly charts in there that are very helpful. Um, but you just kind of dive in, even if you don't know, and you know you have a ways to go, just, just dive in. Like, what's the worst that can happen? It's like the worst that can happen is you're still stuck at the same stage you're at now, but Maybe you go through multiple months in a row and you start finding some aha moments. You're looking at, you know, other people's um, you know, interviews or work they've done and they have similar types of setups that you're keen to. 
And you start to see them latch onto the same idea that you're seeing in a, in a stock chart. And you're like, okay, I'm starting to come together now. But um, like, there wasn't like really a, um, there wasn't a ton of like videos back then either. Like now it's like, there's a lot of uh, awesome content out there on the internet. People can learn anywhere. And, um, but I latched onto Dan, but then I kind of went on my own and just, you just got to dive through charts and you, thousands, like hundreds of hours, like thousands of hours. It's like that Malcolm Gladwell, what does he say? The the 10,000 hours, once you put in 10,000 hours, you're considered like an expert at something expert. Um, but it's important Like you can't get results unless you put in the work and then the technical side of thing and the fundamental side of things, it's not everything, but you, you can't get far without edge and you got to figure out, you know, where's a great place to buy a price chart, where's a great place to sell and things like that. So it's a long winded um, explanation to say, just even if you know nothing, just dive in and, and start taking a look because the worst that can happen is you're still <laughs> stuck where you're at, but you got to at least put in the effort. Um, hope yeah, that's just, helpful. yeah, just one one last follow up question before I let you get going. Um, do you have any tips for staying organized when you're looking at all these different charts and diving deep? And do you have any tips for, you know, getting the most out of each hour? So, you know, it's not just about, you know, looking every which way for a thousand hours. It's about making deliberate use of each hour and getting the most out of that practice time. Yeah, I have a point on that later on. So it's a good, good okay, point because cool. you don't want to be going through the motions um, when you're doing anything. Like, yeah, so you can say, OK, well, I went to work today for like nine hours. OK, what'd you do? Did you pick your nose for seven of those nine hours? And then like you only really put in like two solid hours or or if you're going through your homework, um, market homework at night and you're coming through your watch list, are you just kind of going through the motions and like you're not even paying attention and like 20 stocks have gone by, but you're like daydreaming about something else. It's like you need to put it in uh, meaningful work. And if that meaningful work is only for 20 minutes, then stop after the 20 minutes. If you start to get, you know, uh, out of um, out of your lane and you start to slow down, then just take a break, go away, go on a walk, do whatever. But when you're going through you want to make sure you're engaged. And like, for me, I have like sprints of like a couple hours at a time and then I'll start to kind of, you know, phase out or want to do something else. So I'll do something else and I'll come back when I'm energized again and then I'll dive back into it. But you don't want to get into a habit where you're wasting hours because time is precious. Um, you know, everybody, you know, wants to, to be, you know, financially free and, and successful. But I think the ultimate goal, if you ask a lot of people, it's like, time uh kind of rules rules the roost like time is undefeated and we only have a limited amount of time on this earth and you know how are you going to spend each day uh improving upon you know what you did the prior day what you did the prior week what you did the prior year like i still make mistakes to this day and you know my goal every year is to try and get incrementally better you want to scale up um you know whatever you're doing whether it's trading or whether it's you know building, you know, relationship with your, your family or your wife or whatever, um, you want to get incrementally better. Cause if you're just going through the motions, then you're wasting time, you know, drifting away aimlessly. And, and, you know, I, you think, yeah, even if you're younger, you have a ton of time, but, um, there's a whole concept of like a time billionaire or whatever, when you're young, you have all these years, but it's like the years go on, you realize, you know, you need to make the most of everything. Cause time does fly, especially once, you know, people that have kids probably know it's like you, you feel like you just have a kid and then like years later, they're already 10, they're 10 already in the blink of an eye. So um, it is important, I think, to your point to to really put in meaningful work. And if it's only for 20 minutes, then just do the 20 minutes, come back when you're ready to go. Yeah, perfect. All right. So here's like an early struggle example. So I was, you know, learning breakouts. You know, my mentor was a breakout trader. You read books about breakouts. This is AI. So this is something I would have done back when I was starting out. So you, you, you're starting to identify like a pattern. You can say, okay, here's some support here at this 20. And this was a prior rip up that we had in February. So this like 30 level roughly is kind of maybe the start of like a box range. And so I know if price goes through 30 or call it 31, maybe, um, you know, I'm going to be buying. And so this is what I would do. Like all, there's a couple possible entries here that I'll get to later, but like, this is what I do. I would see something like this and I'd have my alert set at 31. And so I'd be sitting here and saying, wait for it, wait for it. The thing's already up like, you know, a couple percent of the day now. Now it's up like four or 5% and wait for it. I'm just sitting here picking my nose, waiting for my alert to go off. Wait for it. The thing's already like ran into, ran hard 10% into the breakout. And then the alert would go off. I'm like, oh, time to buy. I wouldn't even like look to see what the action was like at the breakout. I would just automatically buy it. And it's extended into the breakout and I'd have a smile on my face because it, you know, ripped 
hard, a few bucks, a couple bucks, pass a breakout. And I'm like, okay, great. And you know, it's going through this base. And then you get, you know, a little bit of indecision the next day. And then bandits might've been like the short report out, I remember. And then you just get crushed. And so <laughs> this is the kind of stuff I was doing. Like this to me is like buying, even though you're buying at the breakout, it's not late per se, but you don't understand that, like, how did it get there? And when you're buying breakouts, you want to have some sort of logical stop distance um, or some, whoops, some sort of meaningful area where you can say, okay, if it breaches this area, I'm getting out. But like here, it's like, there's nothing really here. It's like, where's the logical stop? Like technically, I don't know, maybe in this consolidation here at 26, that's like a four or five bucks stop, unless you're just going to sell right after it fails a breakout. But when you're, you know, in the, the heat of the moment, when you're a novice, you don't really know about this stuff. So like you want to ideally see, you know, tightness in the pattern. And, you know, this is what I was doing. I was, stuff would be up 20% on the day into the breakout and I was buying. And, and so you just really want to make sure that, that you have contacts in place and you want to try and find, you know, tight entries. If you're trying to buy standard breakouts, um, I think that's key. Like this was another one, you know, buying late. Um, this is an example again, like BHVN recently, you got a nice little low level consolidation and you, know, you break out. And if you're breaking, you want to buy a breakout, you want to try and buy as close to the line as possible. And even to this day, like I would kind of have a hard time buying this because it already kind of ran a buck into it from 14 to 15. So after the fact, it's easy to see like, oh yeah, I, I could have bought it. But I mean, it's easy to say in hindsight, like my, my father-in-law always has this quote, um, he, he likes to use about like hindsight. He says, he's like, hindsight is the vision of assholes. <laughs> Cause he always, you know, you get people like that all over Monday morning quarterbacking things. It's always easy after the fact, but you want to make sure when you're going through this, you, you get good at doing things real time. Cause I think people, when you're starting out too, there's a, there's a comfort zone. You're waiting for the all clear before you dive in. But the best times to buy is, is when there's so much uncertainty, like there's always going to be some sort of, event going on. There's going to be a debt ceiling. There's going to be a interest rate. There's, there's always something to worry about, but the market likes to climb the wall of worry. And if it doesn't care, it's just going to keep going. And, and if not, then if it does care, then you know, maybe your setups aren't going to work. But um, I think it's important like over the years to not wait until it's all rosy. Cause when it's all rosy, maybe everybody's already invested and there's no more buyers left and that's when you can get smoked. So you have to, over the years, get comfortable with, with, you know, sometimes buying when it's not in the news cycle is not exactly ro uh, rosy. And usually those are the, the great times to buy. If you see a setup and you know, the whole world's bearish and like bullish setups are starting to form, you should be backing up the truck, getting excited. And they might not all work. They could stop out. And that's why we have risk management in place. But, um, and on the flip side, everybody's bullish and the biggest smiles are on their face. That's when you should probably be looking for potential, um, you know, smacks across the face, but it's things you pick up over time. But like here, for example, this is an example of buying late. You, like, you come in late and maybe you say you buy it near the 17 and it comes up with a natural pullback, you know, back to retest here at 15. But that's a pretty big, you know, stop. You buy up here at 17, you're already, already down 10%. So maybe you throw in the towel and, you know, retest holds and it rips right back up without you, but you don't buy back because you're just dejected. And, and so this is stuff I was doing too. I was buying late. Yes, it's positive that it's coming out of this pattern. And yes, it's a good sign that maybe it will start at some point a move down the road, but it's not going to be a straight line sometimes. Sometimes stocks come back to retest or maybe they don't work at all and they just fail. So again, you want to make sure that you're buying as close to the your edge zone as possible because if you're buying late, then problems can start coming through. Um, so this is another one I was doing when I was in my early years, just buying light. You see the market's up, you know, 2%. All these stocks are running. You're like, ah, oh, you're like rushing to your, your computer to buy something that's like extended in no man's land and late. And maybe it works for a couple of days and you come back, you know, two days later and you've already stopped out. So um, just keep that in mind. And on the, the flip side with stops, like ignoring stops, I would ignore my stops all the time. <laughs> you have a, you know, conviction in a trade for whatever reason, like here's Roblox, for example, Um you know, you, you, maybe you see the gap up on earnings. It holds the hundred level. It starts ramping up. You're up 40 bucks on it. You're like, okay, maybe I'm a long-term holder. I'm going to hold here for the rest of the move. And, you know, lower highs are coming in and it's not really ideal action. You really kind of want to see it, you know, start to giddy up and go again, if things any good. And maybe your stop was back here in the mid nineties and your stop alert goes off and you ignore it. Cause you're like, ah, 
this is a new company. It's got good earnings and it's, it's, I'm just going to order the stop. It'll come back. And then so you get a couple of days of heat. And then you get a you close on high, come back up. You're like, see, it's coming back. I knew I was good not to, you know, sell the stock. And then like this happens and then you get crushed from, you know, 90 all the way down to 60. But, you know, you, you didn't sell because you didn't have a rule or a plan in place, number one. <laughs> and these are things you learn. Like now, like if I had a, a stop alert go off, like I'm just, I'm just out. Um, maybe if there's a gap down, it's not like a, an egregious gap down, like there's news, but it's not too far below my stop. Maybe I'll like watch the action the first few minutes just to see, um, you know, fire stepping quickly. But other than that, like my stop goes off, I'm done. And I'll reassess if, if the trade sets up again. But again, you just got to follow, follow your rules and, and, you know, we want to have stops in place. So then in comes market awareness. Um, you know, market awareness is now entered the chat. You finally realize that all these patterns are not going to work all the time. One size does not fit all. Like I get, I get questions from people like, oh, well, you know what you did, uh, you know, last month or whatever, you know, will that work, you know, in this market? And the answer is no. <laughs> Every single strategy in the market has an off season. I want to be out of the market like as much as I can. Um, I think it's important to realize that if you're trying to catch, like, and people will say too, like, oh, you're not a real trader unless you catch like every single move, the longs and the shorts. Like if you're great at that and you can do it successfully, fine, more power to you. But for me personally, like if I'm trying to catch every swing, that means all my hard earned money that I've earned throughout my life is that constantly at risk. It's constantly out there in the market. It's constantly at risk. Maybe I'm trying to take trades that aren't ideal. Maybe they're like sub average trades and I'm still just firing away because I think the market may be turning or whatever. And I'm not waiting for those A plus setups. And you know, my account's drawing down because you're you're trying to play every single swing in the market. And I think over time you'll realize that, you know, what's working like right now in this market, like some of the best performing stocks aren't necessarily the ones that are leaving from new highs into, you know, continuing on to new highs. It's the stuff that's coming off the bottom. It's like the Carvana is up 200 plus percent. Um, it's like a data dog. I, I hate that stock, by the way, because it just trades so terribly. But that thing, you know, these things get crushed because everybody gets on the same side of the boat and everybody and their mothers are short because they're reading maybe, you know, news articles about the impending recession and everybody and their mothers are talking about recession and you get crowded to the, the downside. And then, you know, once all there's too many sellers and there's nobody left to sell, you get some sort of surprise earnings gap. And like these things have been running, like you look at Datadog, uh, Path, even like look at the net chart the last couple of weeks, these things got crushed and then they're just not even letting people in because who knows if this, this moves get sustained. But in the meantime, these things are ripping like 30, 40, 50% off the bottom. So that's the kind of stuff that's been working. And so over the years, again, you got to just kind of figure out, you know, what kind of market am I in? Um, I, if, it, if my, if what I like to do is not conducive to whatever market we're in, and I don't want to be forcing it. I want to be fighting the market. I want to just be peacefully sleeping at night, knowing my uh, a bulk of my cash that I made from whatever prior period is still intact. Um, so that's ideally where you want to get to. Um, and again, during this phase, you probably still haven't thought about patience, discipline, or risk management yet. Um, so more pain is required. And I will say, you do need to have pain, but when you're starting out, you don't want to put like, your whole life savings into an account and then, you know, put, start with what you're willing to lose first. Um, cause you're going to make mistakes and you don't want to be totally dejected. Um, so just keep that in mind, but like for risk management, like after multiple uncle cries, like the concept of risk management finally kicks in. Like this was me. I ignored this whole concept for, for multiple years when I started, I was more focused on, you know, the entrance of a trade. Um, I was more focused on the bright lights of making a big move, but this stuff's important. I mean, avoiding large losses, is key. Like every large loss started out as a small loss. So you want to make sure and you have good risk management parameters um, in your plan. Um, you know, I now I focus on the potential loss first, not the potential gain. Okay, where if this doesn't work, you know, where am I getting out? Um, you know, it's key to live to fight another day. Like this is a long game. Um, people maybe like younger generation, again, instant gratification, they want to get rich overnight. But in the market, like patience is really key. Like patience is your best friend and this stuff takes years. So, you know, my motto is, you know, if, if all your money is gone, like how could you possibly make any more money? Because your money's gone. You can't make any more money. So staying alive and in the game is key. Um, you know, don't listen to FTX girl. <laughs> you know, she was the one, I forgot what it was. 
I don't know if it was verbatim, but she was mentioning, you know, oh, like things like stop losses. Like we don't think that's like good risk management. I was like, I might jaw at the floor when I heard that. I was like, what is she talking about? And these people are managing, you know, billions of dollars. And um, I, I mean, if you have enough conviction and you don't want to have a stop, then fine. But I mean, for me, um, you know, I think it's, it's always important to have a stop loss. You know, I like to keep mine relatively small. So I, I'll maybe look for tighter consolidation areas. That'll kind of help with that. Um, but even if you have a small stop loss, like you need to make sure you're still picky because you can get chopped up over trading, taking average setups, even though your losses, your stops are small, like you're just getting death by a thousand cuts. So it's key to understand that as well. And this is kind of when I started to, um, conceptualize the idea of like the series of trades. Like I think a lot of maybe novices, they just are in the moment. They focus on like the one trade they lose. They don't even go back, do some post analysis on it. They just on to the next. They lose on that. They just go to the next. It's like a um, like that show. I don't know if you guys have seen Westworld, that old HBO show where they have those hosts and they're just doing like the same thing in like this infinite loop. Um, and like I feel like I was doing a lot of that in the beginning. It's like you just you're do doing the same thing. You know, probably deep down that you need to take a step back and <laughs> and take a harder look at what you're doing. But you just get caught in this rut of doing the same thing over and over and over. So like let's say for example, you know, you make twenty percent on trade number one, like. The question you should be asking is like, okay, the next, you know, four trades, like trades two through five, like, what are you going to do to make sure that like you keep a bulk of your money on that first trade? Because I would make, you know, 20% on trade one. And then the less next three trades, four trades, five trades, whatever, I would be undisciplined and give it back. So I think, you know, knowing that it's a long run, a long game and you have to let the math work out over time, you want to buy with edge or you want to short with edge if you're shorting. And, you know, you want to have decent risk management parameters in place. And that's, you know, where you really kind of make progress is when you start to just chip away, chip away, chip away. It's a, a long, a long grind. Um, so, yeah, you can have short spurts of success. But, I mean, in order to really have some longevity in this game, you've got to have some risk management parameters. Oops. So then comes, you know, plan and patience. So you need a strategy for long-term success. You You have to have a plan with guardrails. What are your buy rules? What are your sell rules? You know, trade review. Do you even, I bet a lot of people don't even go through and, and review their trades. Um, you know, routine, what's your routine look like? Do you have a routine? Um, homework, are you getting lazy with homework? Um, on the weekends, are you coming through, you know, the whole market? Are you coming through charts and what's going on? I think a lot of people just fire from the hip without a rhyme or reason. And it's, it's key to have a plan. You need to have a plan again, that's simple. And repeatable. I think that's going to be help, helpful in the long run. Um, but again, it's eliminating emotions. Um, this could be an emotional game at times. And, you know, if a setup doesn't jump out at you within a second, like once you get your brain trained on, on what to look for and you're in the right environment for the setup you're trying to deploy, you're coming through charts. Like if it doesn't just shoot out at you, like, oh, this is a great looking setup, like you should probably just pass and let another day pass, another two days pass, however long it takes. For that set up to get into the A category, then um, I think that's key as well. Like like patience kind of helps maintain your mental and monetary capital. You know, patience, you know, for the right setup and the right conditions that help alleviate, you know, most of your psych issues. Like if you think about like psychology, like in a simplistic form, it's like, when do you usually have psych issues? It's usually when you're losing money. Like we don't have psych issues when we're making money, like we're all happy and good. But when we're losing money, we're bummed out. And maybe why are we losing money? Maybe we're um, taking non-quality setups. Uh, maybe we're, you know, undisciplined. And so really diving into, you know, the crux of that. And, and I think patience just really, yeah, we all want to get, you know, wealthy overnight or whatever. But if I can hammer the, the importance of patience, like I had zero patience my, you know, first four or five years. And I want to reiterate that like this type of stuff, yeah, you need to learn the the technicals, but this kind of stuff needs to go to the very front of the bus um, for you to have lasting success. So like, here's a plan failure example. Like, you know, you think you have a plan and let's say you bought this shack um, and this must've been earnings on big volume out of this little consolidation and and you're up for a couple of days and you get this little consolidation here. Maybe this little uptrend line gets breached and you're like, ah, I'm selling everything because I don't want to get round tripped. And it's like, look at this volume. It's like nothing. It's like nothing volume. There's nothing egregious about it. So I would do stuff like this. You'd have a good entry and a little hiccup on like a first pullback or whatnot. And then the next day it does this, but you're, you know,
left for dead because you don't have any shares left and because you thought this was like the end of the move, even though massive volumes coming in. And this ended up did coming back, but now it's starting to turn back up on Shaq. But this is the kind of stuff I would do. I would, you know, panic after the first little sign of um the first little sign of potential hiccups. Like you, if you're in a decent market, you want to try and give your stocks the benefit of the doubt. If we're in a bad market and you're counter trend trading, then it's a little easier to just bring the register a little more quickly. But if we're coming out of a big bear, or if we're coming out, you know, in a good market, you want to try and give your stocks the benefit of the doubt. So you could still maybe reduce on this. Like if you have a R multiple of you know, four times your risk, five times your risk, and you hit that on this trade, you can reduce a little bit, but leave a runner because you don't know how high these stocks will go over time. So I would do something like this, same like something like this on MEOH. Let's say, for example, you bought it at 35 and, you know, you got a nice little engagement out of this breakout. And maybe the same type of thing or, oh, I don't want to get round tripped. I'm going to sell everything and lock in a little gain. But and then the next day, bam, <laughs> you're left in the dust and the thing goes on, you know, another 10, 20%. And so I think this is something you learn over time too, especially like when you start to dig into, um, you know, the series of trades and the whole math concept. It's like you can have really low accuracy, but you need to have your winners outpace your losers by a, a pretty decent percentage. So if you're only making two R on a long and then you're losing one R, if you ignore stop, maybe it's a minus two R, then it's hard to make progress. If you have a lower accuracy, you need to let your winners run because those will pay for the losers and then some. So that kind of last phase is, you know, I'll kind of share is like constant evolution. So there's different stages you know, you go through in your journey, but it's, it's almost never ending. So what, whatever level you're at, you know, a year ago, now you're at a new level and whatever level you're at now, you need to get to another level, you know, four years from the line or whatever the case is, but like you got to adapt to market conditions, listen to the market. Um, like for example, you know, when I first started out, I was all breakouts and, you know, my mentors were training breakouts and but over the years I found like different edges and, and pullbacks and I've gotten more away from breakouts than ever um over that time frame because i've done the deep dives i've gone and i've seen how certain stocks move in certain environments and and a lot of my entries now are, are in the pullback variety and i'll still trade breakouts um but you need to you know, really wait for the right environment for that and the right environment for breakouts is usually when you have a herd mentality multiple groups are participating and things are moving in earnest and that really is few and far between so for me like some of the i'm a little more active but you know maybe there's a little bit more um edge like it's just it's a better risk reward for me like buying a pullback near a danger zone than versus maybe buying a breakout um when there's maybe not enough like tightness like the ai example um but the thing with like pullbacks too is like you might have to fire more than once i think people like learning and starting out like they enter a trade it doesn't work out so they give up on it completely and i think that's a mistake like sometimes it takes a couple attempts to get in to a stock and even with breakouts um i mean the best ones will just leave you in the dust and, and it's hard to get into them but sometimes it'll take you a couple attempts to get in and so if you stop out or whatnot it doesn't work the first time don't get discouraged because you know it may set up again and and start to go um but again price can only do so many things like in a simplistic form buyers are in control you're in an uptrend sellers are in control you're in a downtrend maybe there's an impasse and you know, you're range bound. I mean, in simplistic form, like price can only do so many things. So I think where you can really turn the corner is like hone in on you know, refining your plan. If you don't have a plan, get a plan. Um, you know, do you journal. Do you look at your mistakes? Um, you know, what can you get better at over the years? Uh, because you don't want to be stuck in the same talent level you're at now a year from now. You want to get incrementally better. Again, we've covered the, being efficient with your time. Um, and again, if your account grows large enough or if you're you know, working for a fund or whatnot, you, you're going to have to scale and adapt your trading. Um, you're going to be looking at completely different things that maybe you're looking at now. You're going to be diving into economics a little bit more. You got to put on your economic hat. What's the macro view look like? Taking things into consideration you maybe wouldn't even think about taking into consideration when you're just maybe a, a young budding trader. So there's things like that to kind of keep involved. And speaking of scaling too, I think it's important to um, as you get progress and you start making progress, you get more confidence. Um, you really need to make sure that you are um, ramping up your bet size, your position size, as well as your stop size with the growth of your account. Maybe after 50% growth, 100% growth, you don't want to be staying at the same 
um, you know, position size you were prior to that. You want to start scaling up because that's how you grow and you follow your plan religiously and you might get off track here and there. But um, I think that's key is trying to scale as well. Maybe it's kind of scary at first because you're, oh, I'm, I was used to having this position size. Now I'm having even more, more and like, oh, but I mean, regardless of the dollar amount, if you're confident in your plan and, and it's been working, it shouldn't really matter. Um, so here's another early struggle example, like flips, like ev- talking about evolution, going back to that same AI example. Now this is the kind of stuff like I'll look for is, you know, you're still in this box range and sellers after this, uh, this might've been earnings too. I, I, if I'm, or some sort of news, I think it was earnings. So it got completely sold down all the way back to support, but sellers didn't really get that far. Again, sellers will prove that support. Like if there are any good, like there's sellers are strong and they're stronger than the buyers and the stock would have been all the way down back into the teens. Um, flip side, buyers prove it resistance. So if there's prior selling at a certain level and the buyers need to take them out and overpower them. But so I was kind of watching this. I'm like, okay, well, you know, the sellers got down to support. They haven't had any, you know, meaningful power to the downside to break it lower. So maybe there's some sort of, you know, mean reversion back to the other end of the range. If you're into trading ranges, I didn't know this was going to happen, but you know, you get some tightness here. You get, um, you know, sellers starting to dry up a bit. Volume's kind of waning here. You get really tight this day. This is like the lowest volume day in what looks like weeks. And, you know, you can just buy through this pivot. And then as you get back up to the other end, like I would be buying here 10 years ago. Now this is where I'm reducing. I think, you know, Neil will talk about, you get a strong rip up the right side of the base. I'm always reducing into that. Like, yeah, maybe end up being another, you know, Amazon or Google or whatever. Um, but I'm just more comfortable reducing into strength. I think that's something you'll find over the years too, is like, are you going to reduce into strength or are you going to reduce when there's some sort of pattern failure or are you going to reduce when there's a moving average, it's failing. Um, you don't have to sell everything. Um, like in this one, for example, I, I took the trade down here in the low twenties and I reduced maybe like 70, 80% of it <laughs> when it crossed, uh, closed this day. And I still had a runner of 20%. And then on this day, you know, you gap, you got this bar out here by itself and completely fell the break. So I was just completely out and you got your short sellers that got screwed here. And, and so they come out with that short report. And so now they're back into the, into the, uh, the green on their trade. And, you know, once that kind of fizzles out, then the stock sets up again and made another move, same type of thing. So I think it's just key to, to keep being curious, keep evolving. Um, you may get comfort in, you know, one strategy for, five, six, seven years, and then you want to branch out, but don't branch out unless you're successful in that prior thing you're doing again. So this is just kind of an example of like evolving um, over time. And again, putting it all together, um, you can't have one of these without the other, like setups and fundamentals, you know, one side of it, risk management, and then plan, discipline, and routine. You can have a good eye for setups and fundamentals, but if you have horrible risk management, it's not going to matter. And on the flip side too, uh, maybe you're really good at you know, keeping your losses small and you have a plan and then discipline, um, but you're horrible at identifying like what is proper edge. So all of these, you want to get to a point where they are in conjunction with each other and you're not just kind of, I was focused a lot on this in the beginning and I d- didn't even know these things existed. <laughs> so I think my point is to you is to take these two. Yes, it's important to have um, a setup. Without a setup, you have nothing. That is key. But these things, I think, are more important to your um, your long term longevity to make sure you're not beating yourself up too much. So again, base summary: How are we doing on time, Richard? Am I rambling too long? No, you're perfect. Okay. So my point is with this 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 is kind of my phase, my phasing. I would advise to newer people: Yes, you need to have edge. You need to learn edge. It's very important. But this stuff here, aware, market awareness, risk management, plan and patience, evolution, move this stuff up in front of this. And I think if you get this idea in your head sooner, then I think it'll kind of help shave years off your, um, your life. So I could have had a long list here, um, like early mistake examples. We went through some of these. I could, my list is hundreds long, but we don't have enough time for that. But like, for example, a problem, you're buying late, extended, you have FOMO. Again, you see an index up, but you just buy a random stock because you don't want to miss out. You think, and again, I was always joking that, you know, you, you get a couple down days, but then you get a really nice ignition bar and, and like every green bar you would see, you would think like, this is the start of the move. You know, we're going to the moon, we're going to new highs and you put like a bunch of positions on that weren't even set up. And cause you saw the indexes moving. And then two days later you stop out on all of them and you're drawing down because you have maybe one or 2% of your account 
a risk per trade. You take five trades and you're down five or 10% in your account. So I think it's important to, you know, again, the you know, solution is like adjust your perspective. Like, no, this is a long game. There's always another trade. Be patient. You know, ignoring stops, saying, oh, it'll come back. Mine never came back. But <laughs> I mean, my philosophy on stops is sometimes you'll ignore it and you'll be rewarded for it and the stock will keep going. Maybe it's a little shake or whatever. And then you keep going. But I mean, over time, it all even out. So I, my default answer is just follow your plan. And if your plan says, if a stop hits, just sell automatically, just follow it. And, you know, sometimes it'll work to your benefit. Sometimes it'll, you know, go against you, but overall these things kind of average out over time. Um, so again, like learning from ignoring your stops, like the solution for that is just pain. Like it's terrible to say, but like, I didn't start really turning the corner until I finally like cried the uncle too many times. Like I mentioned, it was like, you got to feel the pain. You don't feel too much pain. Again, risk what you're willing to lose, but you got to feel the pain to, to make any meaningful progress. Like excessive drawdowns, um, you know, I think my solution for that, again, you know, size down, you're down five or 10% off your highs, take a step back. Maybe you're looking at your series of trades. You've lost three or four in a row, reevaluate. Um, you know, be picky, journal these things. I think journaling helps too, because you can see something and say, oh, I stopped out and I, that was a dumb trade. I know it was a dumb trade. I'm not going to do it again. And then two weeks later, you know, you do the same thing. But if you actually take a journal, post that chart in the journal and mark up your entries and maybe your emotions you were feeling at the time. And if you keep looking at that and studying it, the visual just hits you straight in the face. And I think it'll be more of a lasting uh, image in your head to say, OK, if I see the same thing happen again, I know I'm not going to do it because I've, I've seen it enough times. I've studied it in my journal. I know what my emotions were at the time. I know they weren't the right emotions. Um, so I think that's important. You know, somebody is lazy, is not doing homework or studying that you're looking for handouts. That's fine in the beginning, but eventually you're going to have to dive in, study thousands of charts because that breeds confidence and confidence will breed, um, you know, more success for you down the road again with noise and, and Twitter and news and opinions. Um, you know, I was watching CNBC and Bloomberg, like when I first started like religiously, and now I haven't turned that stuff on and, um, years and even like Twitter, like I'll follow like people, but I go on Twitter a lot for like my sports updates. I like sports. And, <laughs> um, but you want to be careful that, you know, you're not getting like looped in again to like borrowed conviction. And you want to get to the point where you know, you've done enough study, you've done enough homework and that kind of eliminates the need for noise. You don't need like a second opinion. Like you should get to the point where I, I know what I'm doing. I don't need somebody else to reaffirm what my belief is. Um, Cause I would do that in the past when you're starting out you think you have a good handle on a stock and, and you buy it. And then two days later, some Joe Schmo on CNBC is like, well, I don't like this stock because it's, you know, overvalued or whatever. And then doubt, more doubt creeps into your head. And you start researching that ticker on Twitter, all these different people giving their um, opinions on it. And then you start really clouding your judgment and you're like, oh, and maybe you had conviction on it, but all your conviction's gone now because you're, you're listening to things that aren't, um, you know, helpful to your success in your trading. So I think that's important. Um, you know, racing to find the next trade after a loss. I think that was something I did like all the time. It's like, it's like, you feel like the market's going away forever. And if I don't get this trade in, it's like, <laughs> no, it's like have patience. Jot, again, jot down the emotions you feel. I think that's sometimes helpful. Like I get into certain situations where maybe FOMO might creep in and I know a pattern's not technically, even though it's moving up, I know there's potential danger and I will pass on the trade. And I think that's when you turn the corner, I think for me, the gains weren't the most rewarding. It was like when all of your homework came together and you avoided a trade and you're like, in the past, I know my emotions were this because the market's moving and I really want to catch this momentum move. And, but you're like, ah, I don't know. Like all my studies said like 80% of the time, this pattern is going to come back and fail. And you don't take the trade because you know, like that's the probabilities. And sometimes they'll just make you look like a complete idiot and it'll keep going because you didn't take it. But those are the exceptions, but you want to put the probabilities on your side. I get the most reward when I don't take a trade because I know it's not ideal. And then that stock actually, like I'm trying to buy, for example, that stock comes back down and everybody's maybe cheering it one day. And then the next day it just completely gets crushed. Like that to me, even though you didn't make any money or lose any money, like that to me is like the most rewarding <laughs> thing because you know you have your emotions in check. And yes, yeah, sometimes I'll get off track, but um, it's important to kind of fade your emotions most of the 
time and, and make note of what you're feeling during certain instances throughout your uh, year. So key takeaway, so there's a lot of stuff on here, like a quick side note. Um, you know, my first year in college, I was in business and my professor at the time, I don't know, he was like a CEO or CFO of like AMAT or one of those semiconductors. Like I had my final and I thought I crushed it. And, and, uh, I got it back and it was like C plus. I was like, C plus, what does this guy know? And he, he wrote on there. He's like in the business world, he's like, get straight to the point and, uh, you know, be brief. And so like, clearly it's stuck with me like 20 plus years later as I got a long laundry list of things, but, um, I'll go through these really fast, but, um, again, reverse the order of like my face summary that I had again, you do need to know edge and learn edge, but, um, you know, having a plan, risk management, all that stuff will shave years off your learning curve. Um, so you either go through yourself and learn it the hard way, like through pain and, or you can learn through somebody else's experiences like mine or whoever else. And maybe they had a rough go of it and you're smart enough to know that, you know, these people had a tough time when they didn't have rules in place. So I should probably get some rules and you can learn that way too. But I'm a dumb, dumb, and I'm a glutton for punishment. It took me a little longer to figure this stuff out than others maybe. But <laughs> um, again, patience, patience, patience. You know, if you don't have a plan, get one. You know, trading all the time, as I mentioned, your, your hard-earned money is constantly a risk. You know, you got to shift your mindset from an action junkie, to kind of playing the long game, and get hobbies when the market's not in your favor, do other things outside of the market. You don't want to you don't want to get complacent with your routine. You still want to be full time with your routine. You're going through the, the rigor on the weekend, combing through charts. You're going through the rigor uh, at night. I think routine is important, um, but you don't want to be pressing buttons every day. Um, you know, again, without setup, you have randomness, thousands of hours of chart study required. Yeah, I think it's important to bet big when the market's in your favor and, and kind of head for the hills when, when it's not, which is most of the time. Um, I think if you ask a lot of people to this point, you only need a few stocks per year. And even like the biggest, most successful traders will say, you know, they made most of their money on any given year on like a few trades and then the rest is fluff. So on those fluff trades, maybe they're, you know, B or C trades, like, you know, don't overstay your welcome. Maybe even don't bother taking them. And you know, if, if you're a breakout trader and, and you've noticed that, you know, the last 20 of 30 breakout setups failed in that market you're in, maybe if you see another breakout setup setting up, like, Sure, it could be the start of a turn and, and it'll actually work, but you got to pick up on these things and, um, you know, put the percentages and probabilities on your side, um, fade your emotions. I think it's good to uh, question the crowd, um, you know, the challenge is status quo, be curious, get outside of your comfort zone. Again, it's just uh, evolution. And again, I was more, um, you know, fixated on breakout trading. I thought I was never going to get away from that. And then you learn new skills as you get more consistent with, you know, the first strategy you're using, then you can branch out and, you know, I implemented pullbacks. And as I get more, um, even more seasoned, maybe I'm going to start diving into more of the, the fundamental side of things, taking a deeper dive there. And um, maybe I'll start looking at more economic data, but I mean, a lot of that stuff's lagging in the market. The market's a discounting mechanism, but Again, if you're going to work at an institution or one of these, you know, if you're managing tons of money, then yeah, it's a completely different ball game. Um, but anyhow, tune out the noise, focus on what matters. And to wrap it up, um, some words of encouragement. I always like to end on a, uh, a positive note, but you know, the struggle is the glory. So to me, the grind is the funnest part. Yeah, you're gonna have tons of hurdles and, and setbacks along the way, but you know, once you get to a goal, that's it, the goal's done. And you're like, okay, what's next? But I get enjoyment out of, you know, the challenge in the day to day. And if I make a mistake, am I going to learn from it? Or am I going to keep doing the same dumb things? Um, so it's a really rewarding process for me to like make a few mistakes, fix them. And then once you fix them and you can see that you're, you're you know, fixing them consistently, I think that's important. Um, use failure as a teaching moment. Don't get discouraged by it. Get excited about it. There's a quote from uh, Shaq. I think he was saying, you know, before, Michael Jordan after, I don't know what year it was, but uh, maybe when Shaq was still with the Magic or he was on the brink of winning a championship or going to the finals and he got swept and MJ said to him, you know, before you succeed, you must first learn to fail. And, you know, while we all want to have um, success from the start, I think the worst thing that happened to me is like I was, I had a good first year. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I was, you know, taking other people's advice. And I wish I would have gotten cream that first year to kind of really set the stage for, um, 
you know, hey, this is this could be a potentially humbling game if you, you know, the moment you, you want to eliminate all your ego, like you, you should be egoless in this game. The moment you, have, you think you have something figured out is when you just get crushed. I think Paul Tudor Jones always said that, you know, the, just when I think I had something figured out is like when I got my ass, my ass handed to me. But um, hey, I've never met a successful pessimist. I think Bill O'Neill, RIP, um, would always say this, like, it's okay to feel some doubt along the way, but if you don't believe in your ability to, to make it happen, then you're 100% toast. You have to have a positive mindset with whatever you're doing. It's always good to stay positive. Um, you know, a life without a dream is a life not worth living. So dream big, like, why not you? Um, you know, what's the worst that could happen? You start out now and you fail. I mean, you don't wanna lose a ton of money, but maybe you, you put in what you, you're willing to lose. But the worst thing that could happen is you're you're ideally back to where you started. Like, that's it. So why not take the plunge and go after it and go after your dreams? Because, again, we're only on this earth for so long and, and you want to make your life meaningful. You don't want to have regrets when you're on your deathbed and looking back and say, oh, man, I really wish I would have put more time into this thing I was I was into. Or I mean, if you don't like trading or whatever, that's completely fine. There's a lot of people like not everybody's going to make it like if you want to be real, like not every single person that does this is going to make it. Um, I think the people that are looking for handouts and lazy, those people are going to struggle, but the people that really put in the work and, you know, do their, their deep dives and due diligence and they stick with it, they hit rough patches. They don't give up. They keep trucking forward. Like those are the people that are going to succeed and change their life. Um, so you always have to think positively, dream big. Why not? Um, you know, Bill always said, you know, Dan would always say, if you do your homework, you can make more money than you know what to do with. I think, you know, again, goes back to homework, 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 you know, luck tends to find the prepared, always show up prepared. You know, people will make fun of um, whether you're a bear market and shorting, oh, you only uh, got that because, you know, the market was trending down or the flip side, oh, you only made money because you're in a bull market. I was like, yeah, isn't that what you're supposed to do? It's like, you came prepared, you did your homework and you took advantage of the opportunity that was given to you. So yeah, luck tends to find the prepared. So always show up prepared, <clears throat> excuse me, prepared, whatever you're doing in life. Um, with more experience comes more confidence and confidence breeds optimism. Um, you won't worry about losses because you know, the next winner is right around the corner. I think always having that positive mindset is really key. I mean, you could be, you can have a bad day. You're allowed to have bad days. You can have a bad day, um, whether it's trading related or something else, you can be in a rut uh, people get in ruts every now and then, but, you know, the overarching goal shouldn't change. The overall arching philosophy shouldn't change. You need to be positive. Surround yourself with positive people. You're going to get some, you know, uh, people that are, you know, cynical or whatever, trying to like take you down um, in your journey or whatever you're doing, telling you you can't do something. But weed those people out of your life. Surround yourself with people that will give you, you know, critical feedback. You don't want to hear, you know, rosy stuff all the time. I think it's very important to um, maybe people that are smarter than you or, or better at something than you, you know, you want to get, you know, critical feedback on where you can improve and we want to constantly improve. Um, so I do think that's important, but again, at the end of the day, just believe and bet on yourself. You are worthy of success. You can do it. Um, I mean, again, why not? Uh, you just, you just, there's so many people that are always negative in this, right? It just drives me nuts. Like I can't, I'm a glass half full guy if you can't tell by now, but, uh, it just drives me nuts. That there's just people out there that want to tear, um, people down that have been successful at something, or they just, they're, they're mad because they haven't achieved, achieved the level of success somebody else has, or it's like, we should be like one big happy family here, helping each other out. I get pumped up. Um, when I see other people succeed, it's inspiring to me. It's inspiring. You want to be inspired. You want to have a spark to kind of get you going. Um, so, you know, always have a positive mindset. Nobody wants to hang around a, a, a negative person. Again, weed those people out of your life support, uh, surround yourself with people that are going to get you uh, moving forward. And I'll, I'll end it there. I was rambling for a while. Uh, Ryan, no, this is really great. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. There's a lot of great comments in the chat. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a great point, uh, a great time to pivot to the Q and A. Um, to start things off, I've got a few. Uh, would you be able to run back to the AI example where, you know, the false breakout and then it kind of resets? Uh, yeah, right here. Um, so, so first, um, I want to get your thoughts on, you know, why you were focused on this stock uh, specifically. What, what about the structure, prior run, momentum it had, 
made you focus on it? Obviously, the, the entry tactic here is the key point. Uh, but what what in general do you look for to find a high potential stock? I guess is my question. It's a great question. And and the, the basic of this one is the AI theme is starting to take hold. And this company, for all I know, is the biggest POS ever fundamentally. But look at the ticker name. It's AI. Like, that's all you need to know. <laughs> Sometimes you don't have to overcomplicate things. And you'll, you'll notice over time, too, with any sort of, uh, I don't know if you call it bubble, but um, any sort of group move, like you always get sympathy plays. It's not always the leader that makes the biggest move. Sometimes these little pipsqueak, secondary type names, they can just move like these junky stocks. It's not a junky stock, but it's probably not fundamentally sound. <laughs> um, I don't know for sure. I haven't really dived into it, but like I was just looking at this and the theme starting to take hold. Um, it was catching bids. It went from 12 to 30 uh, with massive volume. That gets it on my radar. You can't buy it here. It's extended, but stuff like this, you're seeing volume pour in. You're seeing a massive move from you know low teens to 30. That's a huge move. So stocks that double, like to double again, potentially. So that was one thing that put it on my radar. And again, the theme put it on my radar and its ticker name is AI. And I was like, okay. I was like, again, this is another example. I was kind of joking earlier. It's like some people will look at the fundamentals. Oh, the fundamentals aren't that great. I'm not training this based on fundamentals. I'm training it based on, you know, the story. Uh, maybe there's some short sellers that got screwed and they're trapped and might fuel, you know, a rally or whatever. So that was really the the justification of like looking at this and, and focusing on the stock. You can just tell though, it's a little wider and looser. Like it's not really yeah. tight. And this one is kind of maybe um, a stock where you have to maybe uh, uh, try a couple of times because you look at like something like this, like I would make a note too. like you look back when you're doing homework and it's so easy to see after the fact, like that it closed through the pivot and it closed out on highs. But for all you know, intraday, the thing could have whipped around like 30 times stopping you out multiple times before closing back at the end of the day. So um, I will admit that this one is a little more wild intraday. And with the more wild ones, you know, you can size down a bit if you don't have the tightest of entries and just give it a little more wiggle room. You still want to arrive at the same stop percentage as a total percentage of your account. But um, yeah, it was just the theme, um, the group. Because again, when you're looking at stocks, ideally you want the market at your back and you want the group theme there. And if you're going to, if AI is going to be a, a leading group, this may not be the leading stock, but you want to be fishing in the right pond. And even if you're catching the third, fourth, fifth, sixth best name and the best group, I'd rather do that than trade the best stock in like some subpar group. Cause maybe that's an outlier. I want to be focusing on group strength. And I think that'll kind of help with, uh, um, you know, your performance over the years as well. Like back when the, um, you know, the pot moves like with Tilray and all that stuff, all those stocks are moving huge, all these group themes. There's always some new theme every year, every other year. Um, so it's good to kind of latch onto those. And and even if a stock's not set up, don't take them off your radar because they might set up in time. And uh, I have no idea where this thing's going, but uh, there's probably more fundamentally sound <laughs> names out there. But again, I don't always trade fundamentals. Like the best opportunity will sometimes be the biggest POS stocks. Like like people will maybe make fun of a GameStop. Oh, how could you even be buying that? Because the fundamentals are horrible. But if you ignore that, you just miss the best opportunity in the market. And sometimes the best opportunity doesn't mean it's the best fundamentals. So again, that's kind of where I opened up my uh, my way of thinking too, because I was more like traditional fundamental. It's got to have all the boxes checked. Yes, I get for a longer term sustained move. That's going to be a requirement. You have to sit through multiple earnings reports. Um, but the biggest I mean, I found like the biggest moves in the shortest amount of time come from some of these, you know, neglected stocks or stocks that, you know, maybe have high short interest. And it's like, you know, Jason Shapiro is like an expert yeah. at like looking at, you know, the contrarian side of things. When everybody's on the same side of the boat, it's like you should you should be probably finding ways in on the other end or at least kind of take if you're looking for, um, you know, longs and the market's been running for weeks, months, you're getting extended. And then another stock starting to set up. You got to be asking yourself, like, do I want to buy this stock? Why? Why is this stock now just setting up? And maybe it's a massive laggard, and I don't want to buy it because it didn't participate when everything else was moving higher. And I don't want to keep pushing my luck as the market's getting more extended, more extended, more extended. So I think that kind of stuff um, comes into play too. I'm not. I'm not really a um, a contrarian at heart, but I, I start taking that kind of stuff into in consideration now. Um, you know, what does sentiment look like? And that's all, you know, 
secondary stuff, but it's another layer to add to your um, to your process. You can have the technicals there. You can have the fundamentals. You can look at sentiments. You could have you know indicators um, as well. So the more things you stack in your favor, uh, again, the better your probability of, of, su of success will be. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. And he touched on a lot of really, really key points there. Um, I've noticed that, uh, you know, having talked to you today and, and also in previous, you know, interviews and, and chats, uh, you seem to really like uh, the breakout or false move higher, the, the kind of flush and then the reset, building a structure, tightening up. And then it goes. So, so this is, there's an example here. And then after I think uh, the the chart you show here, AI almost did it again and had its recent move. Uh, can you talk a little bit about you know that type of setup where it's a false breakout reset type thing, uh, and and why why you kind of like that type of type of entry? Yeah, to my point earlier, it's like you might have to fire a couple of times. Um, again, ideally, you see a setup, you take it. It doesn't even look back again. The famous quote I did Ryan or whoever came up with it, and the best race horses don't go back into the starting gate. That's right. ideal. But most of the time, like even I was mentioning, like during 2020, a lot of stocks still retested. And again, you don't want to be buying late, but a lot of the times they'll get a fail breakout. And sometimes, you know, people get off the trail. Um, they don't think it's going to work out. Oh, I just failed. And um, I mean, if it's on massive volume, like incredible volume, and somebody just got screwed, <laughs> then I don't, maybe don't want to be looking at per se. But um, but if it's kind of failing on just ho-hum volume and, and it's enough time that has gone by where people are off the trail, like if it's like two days later, it tries to go again, I'm like, okay, maybe. But like the more time that goes by when people forget about the stock, because maybe it's a stock that's on everybody's focus list. And when all eyes are on it, sometimes it can be problematic. Everybody sees the breakout. Everybody buys a breakout. The breakout maybe gets faded, fails. And then everybody that was on that stock, majority of the people, now maybe a good bulk of them are saying, okay, it's not going to work. Maybe some people are like, okay, I'll wait for it to start again. But I like to kind of wait for you know things to set up again. And I won't look away from things because sometimes those, those bursts back through you know, the first people that we can was, was the whole, what was the whole, uh, pa was it uh, paper hands? Paper, hand, paper, yeah, hands, paper yeah, hands, yeah. They, they're gone. So now that the paper hand people are gone, now the real move could start. So um, I think it's important, yeah, when you you get a stock that you're focused on, you've been stocking it for weeks, months, and the breakout doesn't work the first time, don't get discouraged. You may stop out and you may try to buy that breakout a couple of times and you stop out a couple of times, fine. But I'm not going to take that. I'm not going to delete that stock off my watch list. I'm still going to watch it every day. If I think it's got, you know, I've got conviction on it from a fundamental standpoint and the, the pattern's still there. It's not ready to, for prime time just yet. I'm not going to take that thing off my focus list. I'm still going to go through it every day and, and wait for it to set up again. So you will see that sometimes the most powerful moves aren't the first time through, but it's the second time. Yeah, perfect. Um, another question I want to ask you um, was diving a little bit deeper into uh, how you simplify things. Cause you mentioned that earlier in your presentation, uh, looking at your charts, that's a key theme. Keep it simple. Uh, what would be, uh, you know, some advice you might share to traders who, you know, maybe when they're starting out, the natural tendency is to, you know, put every indicator on the block on their charts, you know, RSI, MACD, every, everything they can possibly think of and, and, and learn from what would be your advice to them about, you know, finding the setup, the layout that works for them, keeping it simple and, and focusing on what matters. Yeah, you don't want to have your charts look like a laser light show at like a Pink Floyd concert with like 9 million trend lines everywhere, or like 9 million moving averages. And you have like five different boxes stacked down here with like MACD and all that. I mean, look, each indicator has a, a time and a place. But like, for example, if you're looking at stochastics, like if you're a range bound trader and you're using sto stochastics as a layer to say, hey, this is getting a little heated, maybe we got a reversion back to the mean. Um, fine. But you have to know that like these things fail all the time by themselves. So if you're looking at stochastics and you short because it's getting into the upper end of the band and then you think we're going to have a reversion back down, but then you get a trending move and the stock breaks out, like those stochastics will just stay pinned up there on that top upper end for weeks or months. And so then it's useless to you. Um, some people use um, DeMarc, uh, DeMarc counts. And like, I know a guy that, you know, I trade with, he's like, incredibly <laughs> he's like mastered the demarc um side of things and he'll use that as a layer but he knows you know i need to stack it up with other things like things by themselves 
will fail and get run over all the time. So that's why I like to keep it simple, first and foremost, meaning what is the primary driver? Like when you go into your brokerage account and you want to buy a stock, it's based on price. It's not based on a moving average. They don't give you a moving average value. They don't give you like a, a MACD value to buy through. It's a price value. So for me, price is first and foremost. So I don't want like 9 million things clearing my judgment of what's going on on the price chart. I want to know what the, the buyers and sellers and market participants are doing. Um, who's in control? Are the buyers in control? Are we in an uptrend? Are the sellers in control? Are we in a downtrend? Or are we in an impasse, as I mentioned? But you want to make sure and, and you have the structure identified so you're not clouding your judgment. Um, you want to be looking for edge too. So like like something like like this, there's like really no edge in here. It's just like randomness. This is no edge. It's nice if you've got it down here, but um, you know, it's just kind of random price action. So when I have my charts kind of clean like this, it's just easier for me to see the edge developing. And like, again, like in this example, price started to tighten up your near support. Sellers didn't have any juice lower. They kind of shook a couple of times, but this is what I'm keen on. You're, you want price to tighten up. And doesn't mean, again, doesn't mean it's going to work. It's not going to, you know, you don't know it's going to raise the highs. You, you don't know. You don't have a, a crystal ball. But I just found that I use moving averages too. I don't usually keep them on my main radar. I'll use, I'll have them like a separate setting on, on the stock. So if I'm going through my watch list, and I will down to a focus list. Then I'll have, uh, um, I'll look at it like this view, but then I'll go to the moving average view just to see if there's extra, you know, layers stacking up or whatnot. But um I just think simplicity for me is a the setup on my chart. I keep all my bars the same color because I don't want emotions getting into my head. I want to see green as good. I don't want to see red as bad. Uh, I mean, I chose green as you can just choose any color. Um, yeah. But I just want to see the structure of price. Like that is the main thing for me. And then you can start adding on the secondary things like moving averages. Um, maybe there's fundamentals. That's all the added conviction stuff. Like the primary stuff is price, and that's really kind of what I want to focus on um, first. So, yeah, so the simplicity and the setup on your chart. Uh, and then again, the simplicity in your, in your plan and process, you don't want to have 9 million um, different rules because you're just going to confuse the heck out of yourself. Um, and, and I think a fine too is if you're patient enough and you wait for the right environment, it's simple things like, you know, it's, it's interpreting simple price action and, you know, it's a simple buy through the line. And that's all you need. Once the trade is on, like your job is done. You, have no say in how the trade is done. You have your stop in place. The trades either going to work, and you start reducing at your five to one R multiple or whatever your R multiple is. Maybe you hit your your objective. You run into some sell signals down the road. You reduce, or you just get stopped out completely. But your job is done. When the trade is on, like you staring at the screen. Like a lot of times, if people are working, or if you're if you're day trading, you got to be in front of the screen. But if like a swing trader or an investor, um, once you put the trade on, like don't be a slave to the screen. Like there's a funny, um, I was trying to find it. There's a, um, this guy was, it was like a funny gif, but his, the price bar was moving down, but he's like underneath the screen. He's like trying to like blow the price bar back up, you know, yeah. like you could, you could yell at the screen. You could, um, you could do whatever you want, but you sitting there in front of the screen is not going to make the stock do one thing or the other. So sometimes, you know, I might phone me all the time. So I'll just place the trade and then walk away. Cause like when you're starting out, um, and sometimes I'll do it too, but when you're starting out, you could be looking at a daily or a weekly, and the bigger time frames trump all. And you're basing, let's say, your your trade on a, a daily chart, and then you're diving into like a 30 minute chart, and then you see like a little reversal bar in the 30 minute, and you're like, ah, you know, I, I gotta get out because you're sitting in front of the screen watching every little tick, and you sell on some minuscule like 30 minute bar, but on the daily, nothing's broken at all, no moving averages are violated, no support has been violated, the trade is still on but you're staring and causing harm to yourself. So if, if you're that kind of person, then I recommend just setting the trade, put a stop on your phone and go out and do whatever you're gonna do for the day. And you know, if the stop goes off, take a look on your phone and you can sell if you need to. Um, but sometimes I think it's easier, like people will say, well, you know, I I can't do it because I have a, a job. Uh, if you're like a surgeon or something, yeah, then you gotta be paying attention to what you're doing. But people that aren't like, you know, going through their day, like it's pretty simple to just set a alert on a phone. Um, if you have a job or whatever, and then, you know, you can check it, excuse yourself to the bathroom or whatever, if you have to, if you're in a meeting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's so easy to get kind of, um, 
in and out of these things, but yeah, just keep it extremely keep it simple. simple. I, yeah, it's just, I can sit here and talk about simplicity all day. So I know we're pressed for time, but no, no, we're good. Um, position sizing, which you touched on at the end, seems like another layer to it a little bit and kind of a very important layer because knowing when to size and knowing when to size big, size small, obviously it depends on things you touched on, environment, as well as, you know, the quality of the setup, the risk reward uh, potential. Could you kind of touch on that? Because, um, you know, at, at the beginning, you're always told you this, use the same sizing, whatever, 10% of your account. But, you know, that's not always optimal because not all not all situations are created equal. Not all opportunities are created equal. Well, what's kind of your been your evolution for sizing? And especially in the years where you've had 100 plus returns, uh, how have you used sizing to kind of um, push for that and, and uh, take advantage of all those, you know, great opportunities? Yeah, I would say with sizing, like if you want, if you have a good market and you want big returns, like you're going to have to concentrate into like, the best stocks and maybe you have five, six, seven of them. And just each person has a different value of like, what's big. Like somebody might right. think like 5% is a huge position. Whereas like other people are like, that's oh, nothing. And then like 30, 40% of my account and like a high conviction name is, so I don't recommend people doing that. Um, I mean, like people talk about margin too, like margin to me should be earned. Like you shouldn't be right. going on margin if you are struggling, uh, especially if you're in a, if you're in a drawdown, trying to get all your money back, like that's the last thing you should be doing. You need to be grab. Like people talk about progressive exposure. I think that's helpful too. If we're maybe like at a turning point in the market, we're not quite sure if things are going to be working. Maybe you put a pilot position out there to see if it's working and like a interme intermediate setup, and then another one comes along, you can add to it. But sometimes I will add my full position like all at once. Uh, if, if the setup is extremely tight and cause if it's a really tight and you got other variables in your favor, like why bother pyramid in just hammer the thing. And cause if, if you're wrong, then the stop to find out if you're wrong is so small. So in that instance, I will not have a problem just kind of hammering my whole position there. But, um, again, you have to realize that the market you're in will dictate, a lot of what you're doing. Like, are you making progress? I usually won't go on margin unless like I've already had a decent amount of progress. And I know the markets may be turning. Cause again, like when we're coming out of a bear, um, you know, th th things not going to last like a bull market is not going to last like a day or two. Like it's going to take weeks and months for these, these institutions to get positioned into these things. And, um, you know, me or you, maybe it takes us, you know, a day to get into something or, right. but like people pushing millions of shares, like it's going to take them weeks to get into things. So I think it's important to like have patience, but um, just keep in mind, if you pile into a bunch of things all at once, and if you had a, a poor and they weren't a plus setups and you have kind of like uh okay setups and you kind of have a little bit of FOMO because the market was moving big. Like what if you get a gap down the next day, you're on margin and you've got these huge positions and then all of a sudden, bam, you get the rug pulled on you and you're, you're drawing down more than you want to. So I think by default, like if you're relatively newer, the progressive exposure is probably a better way to go. Like don't, like if you're not gaining traction, like why are you adding more money, good money after bad? Like your feedback should be, I'm not making progress. So I'm not going to add anything in there. But if you start making more progress, then you can start adding, adding more positions. And, um, and it's at some point, like sometimes like, People follow the indexes like some of my the indexes may be running but i will not have even gone like that big on any stock because maybe the stocks aren't really set up and maybe it's like a few things moving the market but then it's after the indexes have run and maybe the indexes are basing out then other things are starting to percolate then other things are starting to work and that's when i'm um starting to deploy more capital so it just kind of depends i mean i'm usually more looking at like the universe of stocks, if there's a plethora of stocks working, then I don't really care what the indexes are doing. I want to know where they're at. Maybe uh, they're too extended and any new buy may have some trouble getting any progress. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's something, it's a good question. It's, it's something I think each person needs to ask themselves. Cause if you ask me, I may have a, a certain pain tolerance that's maybe a little higher than somebody else who's maybe more risk averse. Right. Um, so somebody's you know, max position might be like, 20% or his mind might be like maybe 30 or whatever. But when you have a high conviction, you know, group theme or 
stock or we're in a you know bull market. I hate I hate that term bull and bear. It's, yeah. it's, are there setups? I kind of like to think of it like, are there a lot of setups? Um, or what are you trying to employ? Is the setup you're trying to employ right for this market? Um, and if it is, are there a lot of them? Um, I think that's really key. You'll find that out over time, but I, I don't know the bull bear term, but, um, but if you're in a, a, a bull and, and it's kind of like percolating, like, like right now, like in this market, we're starting to turn, but I don't really want to see price go straight up like the right side, like Microsoft's doing it right now. Some of these bigger tech stocks are doing it. Like it's already back to highs, but I kind of want to see, cause we don't have that like QE behind us anymore. And so it's almost like more from here. You just want to kind of see a steady grind. Cause if you look past, like the last couple of times we had a big bear, like 08 and um, uh, the, the dot com bus. Like when you finally break like a trend line, and you start to flatten out. Like it took those those couple of instances, like four years to get back to highs and prices just kind of grinding back and forth. So I'm kind of hoping that we just do a grind. If we're going to continue higher, who knows? Maybe we, the weeklies yeah. fail and we, you know, more news that we're not aware of comes down the pipe and we retrace lower. But for me, you know, I'm hoping from here that we just kind of just do the grind, like sideways, just grind, because that gives you more time for things to set up. Maybe the stuff that is extended now gets the time to breathe, rotate in other things. Maybe the Russell starting to wake up. Um, you know, we get some rotation in the small caps, mid caps. Uh, there might be some opportunities there. So anyway, a long-winded um, way to say it. It just depends on personal preference. And I think that's where experience comes in. Like, right. experience is a great teacher. You get more confidence, the more experience you have. Again, it takes years and years and years to um, put the whole package together, but it's something you have to ask yourself over time. It's like, am I going to be more risk averse or am I going to take on more risk? Yeah, I think that's a good answer. And uh, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. So uh, I think this is a good reminder, especially for the newer traders out here or, or brings up a good topic here. Um, what should be people's expectations for, you know, stuff like batting averages and how do you balance looking for a strong reward to risk ratio with kind of having a, uh, a good batting average and it kind of depends on your style right too if you're more swing you know just just flipping things as it works for you versus trying to catch a bigger move that pays for for your losers right yeah i mean my mindset is um again in the beginning i was like how much can i make on this trade now it's like i'm just 100 expecting to stop out of everything i enter because now yeah. i know that my my mindset is in the right place because if i get stopped out i'm not surprised because in the past i would have high hopes for this trade and then when it didn't work out i was like dejected i was like how did that not work out it had all the the markings of a um you know a nice setup and and now you're dejected and you start to get yourself in a rut you know the market's maybe working and the thing you bought stopped out but other stocks are going so you're like kind of dejected and you, know, you get off track off kilter so now i'm just at a point where like i just accept there's going to be losers and 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 <laughs> in stock land and and I'm just assuming every single trade I take is just going to stop out. And, and if it doesn't great, then, you know, I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, so I think that's helpful um, for me, but other people can maybe pick up on that. But in terms of, um, you know, accuracy, I think being picky will help. I mean, people preach like, Oh, well, high accuracy. Like I want to have like 60%, 70%, but high accuracy doesn't always translate into uh the biggest winning system yeah. because maybe your winner is only like one R or two R. Whereas if you're somebody that's taking small losses and, and you're not like over trading and taking subpar things that are not, ex, you know, out of a base already and you're buying late or extended to no man's land. But if you can find a way to really be, again, this is where patience comes in, like wait, for, I play baseball, right? And so the analogy is like, you wait for your pitch. You're not swinging at anything unless it's, in that exact spot you're waiting for. And, you know, a lot of times in the market, you know, people think it's an ATM, like they can just go in there at any given day and extract money. That's not the case. Like you may not make money for five months on end and cause you're just waiting for things to set up again. Um, but then when it do set up, you want to make sure and take advantage of it. But in terms of, you know, low batting average, sometimes the lowest people with the lowest batting average, like they have the best returns because, um, you know, you're keeping your losses small, but they know that once you catch that winner, you're betting big and you're upping your size and you get, you know, confirmation from the start that this trade's working. Maybe there's another continuation setup. You add to that position. So you have a, a concentrated, um, your portfolio is concentrated in the best names and all those little fluff trades that you took 
are eating away at your batting average, but they're not eating away at your P and L because they're small and you're letting that massive winner, you don't need home runs all the time, but you let in those nice solid trades and you're not exiting early. Like those early failure examples I had where I was selling everything out <laughs> on one sign of a reversal bar, you can reduce a little bit, but again, when you're in a decent market, you got to give your stock the benefit of the doubt. Um, and that's really where you can turn the corner. It's like, I don't care if my, my accuracy is, is lower as long as I'm not doing stupid stuff, ignoring um, my risk management, ignoring my rules, because that's where you're really going to get into some big trouble. Um, so I, I don't know if that answered the question, but um, people uh, people equate high accuracy to like more success, but that's not necessarily the case. It just right. all comes down to how you manage your losers. Uh, and again, you don't, don't want to be getting paper cut to death. Yeah, you may have small losses, but you don't want to be taking 900 trades that aren't really that great. It's like, again, going back to that that exercise, like flipping through charts, if it doesn't pop out at you within like two seconds, then just skip it. Like, just skip right. it. And if it goes without you the next day, you're like, whatever, there's 5,000, 6,000 stocks in the market. There's always going to be another one next, you know, just focus on the next one and and um, try to be robotic about all this stuff. And um, it's a long game, baby. Take your time. The market's not going anywhere. We'll, all, uh, we'll it'll still be here when we're all six feet underground and uh, chugging along. So uh, have patience, have optimism, and uh, good things can come. Yeah, great, Ryan. I, I think that's a good spot to leave it. Thank you so much for your time and, and for putting this together and and for answering those questions. Uh, for people who want to learn more from you, uh, where can they reach out to you or, or learn more about your system if they'd like to? Sure. So I have a, a Twitter page. I finally joined the dark side of Twitter. Uh, <laughs> A couple of years ago. I mean, Twitter is great. I mean, if you're, there's so much, so many good resources on, on Twitter, you got to use it um, in the right context. There's also a lot of um, noise on there, but um, it's a great place to learn. Um, you can go to hiddenbreakouts.com. Um, I've kind of outlined in detail, you know, how I, my process, how I use my process and, and creating a plan for your own, go into detail about, you know, the, the pullback entries and things like that. But regardless of where people learn, um, you know, I just hope the best for everybody. Again, I'm not really a, a hater. I love to see people succeed. So um, I wish everybody the best. And um, hopefully uh, you guys can take your uh, skills to the uh, next level. Mm -hmm.